And now I'm going to hand it over to Lee Koch, who is the coordinator of the East and Stucco TRG. Lee? Right, thanks, Laurel. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, everybody on the East Coast and I guess in the central United States. And then good morning for everyone on the, on the uh, West Coast. Um, uh, but today, uh, Dave Finley, he's going to be uh, giving a presentation on East Repair Basics. And uh, just real briefly, just the introduction to Dave. Dave is a, uh, a, a graduate of Penn State. He, uh, he joined uh, WJE in 2008. Um, most of his work, uh, you know, like much of us, he's done a lot of his, his experience is a very wide range. Um, but his sort of his expertise or the area that he's sort of focusing on is more building envelope. And uh, obviously a lot of that is with the ethos. Um, he is a uh, certified East professional. Uh, that's uh, a, 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 a um, presented by the American Wall and Ceiling Institute. And uh, he's, uh, he's, a, he's a member of the TRG, uh, the core group of the East Plaster and Stucco. Um, other, other webinars that could be uh, used for, for basic EIFS uh, investigations and, and uh, just basic information is a uh, EIFS basic webinar that was presented, presented several years ago with, by uh, Gary's Ware. Um, another one, a fundamentals, fundamentals EIFS investigation uh, by Christine Zimmer. And then another one that was uh, challenges and uh, conditions that was uh, presented at the last uh, conference we had last year on uh, Stucco and EFAS uh, by uh, Kevin Collada and Mike Korst on uh, some, some issues, common issues that we found with tradable EFAS. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave, and uh, he's going to present his presentation on East Repair Basics. Thank you, Lee. Today, we're going to discuss the repair basics of exterior insulation and finish system, commonly known as EIFS. It has been several years since the last webinar on EIFS, so we will start with an overview of this cladding material, including the differences between drained and barrier EIFS. We will then move on to review common problems associated with EIFS, which are typically installation-induced, and how best to repair them. Much like the learning objectives, this presentation is broken down to first understand what EIFS is, how and why it fails, and how to repair those failures if they occur. There are a few different EIFS assemblies, but they all consist of rigid insulation covered with a cementitious lamina. It is important to understand that this is a system assembled with proprietary components from the EIFS manufacturer. You should never mix or substitute different manufacturer's components on a project. This could void the manufacturer's warranty and will make the EIFS non-code compliant. The rigid insulation can be either extruded or expanded polystyrene or polyisocyanurate. Both extruded polystyrene and polyisocyanurate are not commonly used and will not be discussed further. The typical insulation used is expanded polystyrene, colloquially known as beadboard, but I will refer to this insulation as EPS. The quality of the EPS board is determined by bead fusion, and this is critical for performance with respect to water resistance, vapor diffusion, crack resistance, and R value. The image on the right shows various degrees of bead fusion. For a quick field test to determine if the EPS is well fused, rub your hand across the board. If beads cascade off, it is not well fused and should not be used for the project. The EPS can be either mechanically fastened or adhered to an approved substrate. When mechanically fastened, the fastener shown on the left is typically used and seated slightly below the face of the insulation board without fracturing it to allow for rasping. Skewed or overdriven fasteners can cause distress to the EPS and the lamina. Typically, the fastener should penetrate the substrate not less than one inch, with exception for steel framing, where a minimum of 5 16ths of an inch is required. 
For adhered EPS, a non- or sematitious adhesive can be used. Typically, sematitious adhesive, which is usually the base coat material, is used to secure the EPS to an approved substrate. There are two main methods for applying the adhesive to the back of the insulation boards. Vertical notched, shown on the left, and dab and ribbon, which is shown on the right. The vertical notched is recommended as it provides channels for drainage and drained eaves and a small air gap to promote drying. The vertical notches should be no less than 3 eighths of an inch thick and the spacing of the notches should be consistent with the published instructions provided by the eaves manufacturer. The dab and ribbon should never be used on sheathing. It is only viable on concrete and masonry substrates. The perimeter ribbon should be 2 inches wide and 3 eighths of an inch thick. The dabs should be 4 inches in diameter, 3 eighths of an inch thick, and spaced 8 inches on center. The east lamina, as shown here under magnification, consists of a base coat with fully encapsulated reinforcing mesh and a finish coat. The lamina can be polymer based or polymer modified. Polymer based or PB laminas are most common and used with expanded polystyrene insulation. Whereas polymer modified or PM laminas are used with extruded polystyrene insulation boards and are less common. The reinforcing mesh is an integral part of the EAPS. It provides crack resistance, impact resistance, and helps determine the proper thickness of the base coat. There are several varieties and densities of mesh, which include standard for the field of the wall, intermediate and high impact for areas that are expected to potentially see extraordinary loading, such as vehicular impact, and corner mesh, which is used at inside and outside corners. It is very important for the water, crack, and fire resistance performance of the base coat that the reinforcing mesh is embedded into the wet base coat and completely encapsulated on both sides by base coat. According to ASTM C1397, standard practice for application of class PB EAPS, bare mesh shall not be visible and the mesh pattern shall not be tactile. One of the aspects of EAPS performance that is not often considered with regard to reinforcing mesh is its alkaline resistance. The alkalinity of the sematitious base coat can cause embrittlement of the glass fiber mesh, which has a direct influence on the crack resistance. Accordingly, EAST manufacturers have their mesh tested to ASTM E2098, which exposes the mesh in an alkaline environment of a pH of roughly 12.5 for 30 days and cannot exhibit a loss of strength greater than 50%. The reinforcing mesh can oftentimes signal which manufacturer's product was used if submittals or other documentation is not available. This table lists common manufacturers and the color mesh that they typically use. Please note that manufacturers can change their mesh color at any time. This partial listing is based on the mesh color document found on the East Stucco and Plaster TRG site and was last updated in 2011. As mentioned previously, there are two main types of EAPS, barrier and drained. Barrier EAPS relies solely on the base coat to protect against water infiltration, while drained EAPS also uses the base coat as a defense against water penetration. A water resistive barrier that is supplied by the EAPS manufacturer is used as the main protection against water infiltration. Drained EAPS also needs flashings and other related components to direct water to the exterior. Be careful not to assume that drained EAPS is installed simply because a water resistive barrier is applied. At this residence, the contractor applied still gold coat on the OSB sheathing. 
but there is no means of drainage based on the application of the adhesive with notches in both directions, and no other components such as flashings were installed. The water resistive barrier is simply adding protection to the OSB, but this is technically going to perform as barrier ease. For more information on drain ease, please refer to the portion of the 2016 conference presentation, Stucco and East Challenges and Considerations, titled East with Drainage, I'm Good Right, presented by my course and Kevin Collada. That's the basic refresher of East as a cladding assembly. So let's review what can go wrong. There is a plethora of issues, and this has generally led to its bad connotation amongst the industry. But if it is designed and installed properly, these common issues can be avoided. One that may not be entirely avoided is impact damage. Reinforcing mesh with increased density can be used to strengthen the lamina when in locations that may be prone to impact from vehicles, occupants, and even birds, such as woodpeckers. The east projection on the left was used for freestyle skateboarding by college students. College students were also the culprit of the damage to the east parapet wall on the right when they were having a competition to see who could throw the roof ballast into the east the furthest. It's likely best to just avoid east on college campuses. It clearly doesn't stand a chance. More typical impact damage occurs from suspended scaffolding, as pictured on the left, and entrance canopies from taller vehicles, which was repaired in the figures on the right. One of the most common issues is cracking, which can be limited to within the lamina or through the insulation board as well. Typical causes for the cracking or delamination is attributed to dissimilar substrates, insulation board alignment and thickness, poor installation of the east lamina, lack of expansion joints, or poor adhesion of the insulation boards. If the lamina is applied to a substrate other than the insulation board, then provisions to accommodate the differential movement are necessary. Otherwise, a crack will develop much like that pictured on the left. In this particular case, the plywood blocking for the window extended beyond the rough opening shown in the top right. So as you can see in the retained sample in the bottom right, the installer notched the EPS board around the plywood and applied the lamina continuously over the EPS board and the plywood blocking. Since no provision for the differential movement between the different materials was provided, a crack developed at this location. The placement of insulation boards is critical to avoid cracking. Significant stresses, typically a magnitude of five to 10 times higher than the stresses normally found within the field of the wall, will develop at square corners of openings, such as windows and doors, and inside and outside corners. As such, it is important not to align board joints with corners. Otherwise, cracks similar to that shown in the picture on the left will develop. An inspection opening was made to confirm the alignment as seen on the right. In addition to alignment with corners, the insulation board joints should also not align with sheathing board joints to avoid cracking. Further, gaps like that shown in the figure to the right must be filled with insulation. If the board joints are not tightly fit and flush, cracks can develop in the lamina at these gaps. Typically, all joints greater than a sixteenth of an inch should be filled. Another insulation issue is thickness. The minimum thickness of insulation is three quarters of an inch. Therefore, if aesthetic reveals are in the design, the insulation thickness must be thick enough to maintain three quarters of an inch from the depth of the reveal back to the substrate. Otherwise, a crack will likely develop within the reveal, similar to that shown on the left. One project, the depth of the reveal, went through the entire thickness of the EPS board, which is shown on the right. 
As previously alluded to, stresses at corners are significant, and EAST manufacturers require double wrapping reinforcing mesh with an 8-inch minimum lap to increase the strength of the lamina at inside and outside corners. If the installer deviates from this requirement, cracking at the corner can develop similar to that shown on the figure on the left. In addition to special detailing at building corners, additional diagonal reinforcing mesh is required at rough openings to reduce the tendency for diagonal cracking to develop at the corner, as shown in the picture on the left. Since the performance of the base coat relies heavily on reinforcing mesh being fully encapsulated and the proper coat thickness, it is critical to ensure that if multiple layers of mesh, as would be expected at high impact locations, that the mesh is installed one layer at a time and placed in wet base coat and encapsulated before applying the next layer. Otherwise, the base coat may not be fully keyed into the mesh, similar to that shown on the left. Delamination of the finished coat and exposure of the reinforcing mesh can occur if the mesh is near the outer surface of the base coat, as seen in the magnified cross-section on the right. Again, it is very important that the reinforcing mesh is embedded into the wet base coat and completely encapsulated on both sides to maintain proper performance with regard to water, crack, and fire resistance. Cracking, crazing, efflorescence, and delamination can occur if the right mixing and environmental conditions are not present when applying the east lamina. For instance, the base and finish coats are typically water-based. If a pail of base or finish coat is exposed to freezing temperatures, this can result in delaminations or wash-offs because the polymers in the mix do not coalesce, meaning that the polymers that make up the guts of the material don't lock together during the curing and drying stage. The finish coat is more sensitive to environmental conditions. Although the finish coat will dry typically in 24 hours, the moisture in the finish coat will take longer to evaporate when the relative humidity is near 100%, the temperature is near or below 40 degrees, a dark colored or heavily tinted finish has been selected, or if condensation forms from evening or morning dew, which can soften the wet finish coat. Mix three mixing should obviously be avoided. This includes substituting components in EVs or modifying the mix ratio of a particular EVs base coat. In the photo to the left, the base coat was modified by adding additional Portland cement, sand, and water, resulting in cracking and efflorescence. This particular project had a second base and finish coat applied over the original due to cracking. However, the second application caused a cohesive failure within the original finish coat. While refinishing can be done, the coat thicknesses, which affects water and fire resistance and overall durability, and the lack of reinforcing mesh doomed this installation from the beginning. Since the base coat thickness is critical to performance of the system, utilizing petrography to analyze the thickness and embedment of the mesh is highly recommended in some EAS investigations. Cracks can also develop if expansion joints are not provided to accommodate anticipated movement at floor lines, particularly for wood frame structures, building expansion joints, planar and height changes, length exceeding 75 feet, and between prefabricated east panels. One project had an odd adhesion issue in that the adhesive for the EPS boards was not developing bond to the water-resistive barrier. Testing indicated that a contaminant was present causing the delamination of large sections of the east cladding. But of course, the manufacturer would not elaborate further to protect their proprietary information. In the end, they decided to mechanically fasten the east cladding, which is pictured on the right. 
Water infiltration has dogged east since the 90s. While drained east can provide extra protection against infiltration than barrier east, some problems can prove to be a nuisance for both. As shown previously, the finished coat can cohesively fail, and this is especially true if sealant is installed such that it is adhered to the finished coat. In the photo on the left, remnants of the finished coat are adhered to the sealant, but have separated from the east lamina. These failures can create a path for water infiltration, especially for barrier eaves. All sealant should be adhered to the base coat only, as shown in the detail on the right. Improper flashings can also lead to water infiltration. One such condition is parapets interfacing with a vertical wall. Most will terminate the coping at the vertical wall and apply a fillet bead of sealant as shown on the left. However, fillet seals are not the best sealant profile and it will likely be adhered to the finish coat as previously discussed, resulting in an easy path for bulk water to enter the parapet causing damage as seen on the right. The overall design and roofing industry does not adequately address saddle flashings for this condition of parapets to vertical walls. Luckily, the East industry has the most comprehensive detailing for this condition as both Drive It and Stow provide stepped, isometric details for their manufactured systems. Another troubled area is steep slope roofing adjoining a vertical wall which requires a kick out or diverter flashing. Without the flashing, cracks can develop in the eaves, as shown in the photo on the left. And water can bypass the gutter and be deposited into the wall system, causing various degrees of damage like what is seen on the right. The concept of kick out flashing is not new for the steep slope roofing industry. However, how it relates to eaves cladding was not as obvious when it was introduced to the market. Since then, the East manufacturers have developed details to address this issue. It should be noted for the repair of this condition that the East is held two inches above the surface of the roofing. The step flashing that integrates with the kickout flashing extends a minimum of four inches behind the East, and that the kickout flashing extends through the East and is sealed as shown in the inset detail. Many east claddings utilize projections to add depth and profile to the facade of the building. If the skyward face of those projections are not designed and installed properly with a 6 and 12 slope, water sheeting down the face of the cladding is impeded and can accumulate at these areas, resulting in biological growth, erosion of the lamina exposing the reinforcing mesh, as seen on the left, or exploiting cracking at these locations causing water infiltration. That was an overview of the prevalent issues in East Cladding that need repaired. So now let's look at a few strategies to do so. Many owners and facility managers gravitate toward elastomeric coatings because of cost and a minimal understanding of the problems at hand. Many elastomeric coatings are 100% acrylic emulsions containing specially designed acrylic polymers. These coatings are high build, dirt resistant materials that are flexible over a range of temperatures. Silicone elastomeric coatings may have greater elongation and water vapor permeance than acrylic coatings, but they are more prone to pick up dirt. Regardless, both coatings have limited crack bridging capacity, provided that the crack does not experience movement. For instance, Stowe's silicone coating cannot bridge a crack in excess of a 32nd of an inch. Newer technology has hit the market that adds a hydrophobic property to the coating, which limits the surface area of water in contact with the lamina surface, which can also reduce the deposition of dirt on the surface of the wall. Coatings have an effective use for aesthetics, but as a repair strategy, is considered a band-aid and should be avoided. 
for minor damage to the finish coat and or base coat where the reinforcing mesh has not been compromised. The affected area should be cleaned and the appropriate material should be applied to the area such that it matches the existing color and texture of the surrounding lamina. Where the reinforcing mesh is compromised, which most of the issues discussed previously will likely involve this repair, the lamina will need to be removed at the distressed area. For some of the issues discussed, the EPS insulation will need to be removed and reconfigured and or flashings installed. Once those items are addressed, the reapplication of the lamina should be performed as listed or the existing reinforcing mesh should be exposed 8 inches beyond the repair area to allow for the proper lapping of new to existing reinforcing mesh. In cases of impact damage, increased mesh density can be applied at this time. However, care should be taken not to add mesh without having a proportional increase in base coat material. The finished coat should then be applied to match the color and texture of the surrounding lamina. Depending on the extent and size of repair, consideration may be warranted to provide an elastomeric coating over the entire building to achieve a uniform appearance. Otherwise, repair areas may be blatantly obvious as seen in these examples. Where cracks develop in aesthetic reveals, a simple stopgap to prevent water infiltration is to apply bond breaker tape and sealant within the reveal. This is a short-term repair until a more permanent repair can be accomplished. The repair shown on the upper left is not ideal as the sealant will likely be adhered to the finish coat, which may eventually cause cohesive failure of the finished coat and allow water to bypass the sealant. In lieu of this, the crack should be addressed per the base coat repair strategy we just discussed. Should the EPS board need adjusted because the minimum three-quarter inch thickness was not present, as was the case with the project pictured on the right, then the eaves should be removed down to the sheathing and restored accordingly. For all applications of sealant, the sealant should always be adhered to the base coat and never the finish coat. In addition to repairing ETH, ETH can also be used as a repair itself by overcladding existing cladding. The project on the left is an interesting situation where an anchor store of an active shopping mall built in the late 1960s was being repurposed as a hospital which is quite an interesting combination. Regardless, they needed to insulate the exterior walls, which consist of glazed brick masonry with CMU backup. But the elevated humidity for the hospital and the condition of the brick masonry precluded the insulation being installed on the inboard side of the wall. So the owner elected to go with east overcladding. The challenge was confirming that Stowe's components would adhere to the glazed brick face. As such, adhesion testing was performed, which was successful. The end composition of the ETH included Stowe's dispersion wash prior to the application of the base coat adhesive, EPS board, and their standard lamina. The picture on the right is an older project of the Fairmont Copley Plaza Hotel in Boston. This high-end hotel needed a facelift based on customer reviews. So in order to update the curb appeal, it was overclad in ETH. At the time of the project, which is around 2001, overcladding with ETH was comparable in cost to 100% cleaning and repointing. For some projects, the extent of repair to the ETH is so great that a complete recladding is necessary. This hotel had issues with EPS thickness it reveals, the laminating lamina, and poorly installed reinforcing mesh. By the time the EPS is removed it reveals and the original lamina is removed, there would not have been much original ETH left. 
so reclouding was warranted. It also gave us the benefit of being able to transition the existing barrier east to drain east. The photo on the left shows the facade with the east removed. In order not to disturb the fiberglass spacer of the gypsum sheathing, the manufacturer was okay with leaving the adhesive layer and applying the water-resistant barrier over the adhesive, provided that all EPS remnants are completely removed. The EPS remnant seen on the left-hand photo shows that the vertical notches were not always used as the arrows point to locations where some deviation occurred. The photo on the right shows the wall now coated with the liquid-applied water-resistant barrier. The isometric detail on the right was part of our repair documents, which shows flashing integration, proper sealant application, and back wrapping of the reinforcing mesh. Back wrapping of the mesh is required at all east edges, including, but not limited to, windows, doors, electrical, mechanical, and other through wall penetrations, louvers, etc. Back wrapping is required to provide a watertight termination, an edge for the application of sealant, and most importantly, fire resistance. An office building in central Pennsylvania had a partial collapse of the brick masonry at the corner of the building due to a vehicle running into the corner causing initial displacement of the brick masonry that subsequently fell off. The sheathing and building wrap that you see is not original to the building, as that was installed after the collapse because the interior gypsum board was exposed, which is seen at the arrow on the left-hand photo. The original wall construction, as seen in the upper right, utilizes brick masonry and EPS insulation over back-to-back -back studs with either interior insulation and gypsum wallboard low ceiling finishes, or simply open to the interstitial ceiling plenum as pictured. The brick was held back to the studs with corrugated metal ties with a nail that was simply wedged between the back-to-back -back studs. While this is not an ideal anchorage, the detail for that stud system from the time of construction does not illustrate the anchorage much differently. Because of this, the, the local building inspector encouraged the owner to remove the brick masonry and recloud the building. With that suspect anchorage and other areas of clouding displacement, the owner elected to remove the brick masonry and install drain eaves over sheathing. These are some examples of our recladding design for this project, which also required some structural retrofit details for the existing studs. Not all recladding has to put back east. This project at the University of Cincinnati was reclad with metal panels in lieu of going back with east. But if east is redone, be sure to avoid the pitfalls we discussed today. In summary, when repairing east, make sure the reinforcing mesh is fully encapsulated within the base coat. The reinforcing mesh is properly lapped and back wrapped. The insulation boards are applied to the substrate properly and that joints do not align with corners and that sealant is not adhered to the finish coat. I hope that this was an informative and succinct refresher on east cladding and repair basics. Are there any questions? All right. Thanks, Dave. Um, so let's go ahead and see if we have any to start us off here. Okay. So, Dave, here's your first question. Has anyone studied to what extent the grooves in the insulation adhesive actually remain open for drainage after the insulation has been pressed against the underlying sheathing? Doesn't the compression of the adhesive close the grooves? Uh, to my knowledge, I don't think that that has been uh, actually re reviewed or investigated. Uh, I know that 
manufacturers try to keep the spacing of those beads, uh, well, the vertical beads, to uh, limit the, the squeezing and compression of that so that there does remain a channel. I know that they also try to keep it at uh, a minimum of three-eighths of an inch thick just so that the, when you do compress the insulation that there is some minimal gap there. And really, I mean, three-eighths of an inch is really all we need uh, for most uh, drainage and for drying capacity. All right. The next question here says, on projects where a new finished coat is being applied, what are acceptable methods of preparing the original finished coat surface? Well, the first step is it has to be cleaned. Uh, usually, in most cases, there's going to be a, enough uh, carbon soiling and, and uh, other biological growth that needs to be removed. Uh, beyond that, um, most part, it's just a, a, either an elastomeric coating that, in that you can either impregnate some sand in with that, or you'd actually use uh, the new finish coat. All right. The next question here says, is, um, says, where gaps are left between insulation panels, is it acceptable to fill them with spray foam instead of thin strips of insulation? Yes, it is. It, it can be done as long as we can, you got to make sure that it remains flush with the surface. So any excess expansion of the foam needs to be sliced off and remain flush with the EPS board. All right. The next question here says, um, emphasis is made on encapsulating the reinforcing mesh. Is there a standard base coat thickness? Uh, typically, the standard thickness should not be less than an eighth of an inch. Uh, however, if intermediate or high impact mesh is used, uh, then the, the thickness will increase as both the increased de density mesh and the standard mesh that goes over top of it needs to be encapsulated. All right. The next question says, rafting was mentioned briefly. What is rafting? OK, uh, similar to you know filling the, those voids with spray foam, uh, in order to put the, the lamina on, you need a, a level and uniform surface. So rasping is basically sanding the EPS board, usually with a 12 grit floor sanding paper. And the rasping also opens the cells of the insulation for the base coat to key into. It's uh, important to rasp the entire surface, though. If, if just the joints are done, the wall will appear to, to have waves in the lamina. All right. And there's another question here. It says, why should the ribbon and dab method not be used on sheathing? Uh, well, sheathing boards are uh, more sensitive to moisture than uh, mas uh, masonry and concrete substrates, uh, especially moisture with hydrostatic pressure. And the, the dabs may not take a perfectly round geometry to shed water. Uh, so if the dab has a slight flat or concave profile, incidental moisture that gets behind that EPS board could collect at a dab and be held against the sheathing board. You know, substrates like CMU and concrete have a, a greater moisture storage capacity, and the capillary redistribution of that water is, is, is of the perched water at the dabs is much more um, not as sensitive as sheathing boards. All right. Well, I don't see any more questions. Everyone, you have just another minute or so to type those in if you have any questions right now. Um, Dave, thank you so much again for presenting. Is there anything else that you wanted to, to add before we wrap things up today? Uh, no, thank you very much. Thanks so much for, for sharing this with us this afternoon, and thank you to everyone else who joined us.